everybody for join us, joining us tonight. Ciao and welcome. I'm Benedicta Jumpas, Student Life Coordinator of Temple Grove, and I also coordinate the initiatives for Black History Month here on campus. So uh, this is our third edition, and tonight we have our final event. Thank you to each one of you that has supported us through each event from the guests, artists, staff, the dean. Also, we have Black History Month Florence as well showing us support too. So the theme of this year, Black History Month, is constant flow. As history is always in the making, like a river that is constantly shaping, it's surrounding and it moves and it shapes its time and space. This also includes Black history and music. It's always becoming, always evolving. There is no one kind of Black music, although oftentimes we see with awards that well, there is a limitation sometimes when it comes to Black artists. But it's so, Black music is so varied and, and it's always in the making, it's not stagnant. So, and I think also when it comes to music, as well is important that we realize the flow, the movement. And as we look at, at the analogy of the river, okay. as we look at the analogy of the river, it's important that we look forward. We look at the fact that we will get to the ocean, we'll get to the sea. And what, what do I mean by that? When we're uh, saying that, I'm talking about looking at the future. So tonight's event topic is, we have a presentation by a Black Samurai, you know, as, well as Charles Batchel, who was with us also last year, who is an artist, produce, producer, and teaching consultant at Carnegie, Carnegie Hall. But I'm limiting myself because he has so much, so many achievements that really, I, I think I, I could spend all night to talk about them. And uh, so that the event will focus on, Af on Afrofuturism and uh, Black creative imagination through the lens of music. And this lecture will cover a wide range of music in the last hundred years and in reference to the musical roots throughout Africa and its diaspora and the link with innovation modern artists such as Jonah Monet, Prince, uh, Flying Lotus, Tender Cut, Black history events Charles shared, shared that oftentimes do focus on the troubled history of African Americans and may I extend as well oftentimes when it comes to Africa and its diaspora as well. But Charles shared that we'd like to use this platform in a way that we can imagine and create better futures for ourselves to the resistance of American history and above also worldwide global history. Thank you so much, Charles, for being with us and I'll leave the floor over to you. Thank you, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so yes, my name is Charles and <clears throat> basically, long story short, I'm a music producer. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm actually based here in Rome. Um, and I've been teaching and performing music for almost almost 20 years at this point. And um, one of the things that I guess I can say is my specialty is seeing the link between different genres of music. New Orleans, if you don't know, is a very special place in the United States and it's a very special place for music. New Orleans is the birthplace of a lot of American styles of music like jazz, blues, rock and roll, funk music, all of this has its roots in New Orleans. And the reason for that is because New Orleans was one of the only places in America during colonial times where the enslaved Africans were allowed to play the drums. This is super important. They weren't allowed to play the drums every day, but they had one day a week on Sundays where they were allowed to play the drums. And because of this, eventually they were able to also get their hands on European instruments. There was also a big free population of uh, people of color who then went on to study in Europe and study European instruments. So what happened is that you were able to get all these different sounds and mixtures of the European, you know, marching band music as well as the African drums from West Africa, all mixing inside, you know, this kind of cultural melting pot where you had people from France, people from Spain, 
the Native Americans, of course, the enslaved Africans, the people from all different regions of Europe, all in one place. What happens is that you get all these different types of musical styles kind of blending and molding, and that's why you see so many different types of music coming from New Orleans. Um, so part of what I wanted to really focus on today um, is about, I guess, music and technology and the, and the intersection of that and how throughout history, black artists have used technology as a way to kind of reclaim their creative imagination, right? So <clears throat> briefly, it was hinted at um, my, dis my topic is Afrofuturism. And for those who don't know what Afrofuturism is, it's basically a term that describes kind of um, a school of literature and music and art that takes elephants from uh, it takes elements of science fiction and fantasy as well as um, themes from the African diaspora and essentially it's a medium and a way in which black creators have used to imagine new futures and different futures kind of as a resistance to the current realities that they uh, experience but I want to Sorry about that. So, basically, this Afrofuturism concept, it really got its name in around the 70s and 80s, but the earlier um, kind of innovators, pioneers, and people like Sun Ra. So I'm going to play really quickly a clip of a recording from the 60s so you can hear just kind of the sound that was going on for people who were exploring these themes back in the, the early 60s. So that's an excerpt from Sun Ra's orchestra, orchestra as he called it, with an A, which basically at the time, this is, for those who are familiar with jazz music, this is a time of big band music, Duke Ellington, things like that. And his music was really, really left field. It wasn't things that you could dance to. And all of the titles usually had some type of reference to space or technology or just something that was you know, outside of the norm. This eventually evolved to sounds like this, where embrace embrace more technology, more electronic instruments. And the idea is that all this music is evolving at the same time. So jazz funk, blues, rock and roll, all this music is evolving at the same time. So you can hear, you know, there's kind of this dissonance and these different things happening, these different sounds clashing. This was meant to create 
a kind of, um, a, for lack of, a, lack of a better term, a sci-fi type of feel, a kind of futuristic feeling, something that didn't sound like it was supposed to be on planet Earth. And Sun Ra himself would oftentimes say that he was from Saturn, even though he was born in, I believe he was born in Mississippi. And the idea was during the time that he grew up in America, things were very, very segregated. Um, basically, black people couldn't go to the same restaurant to use the same services as white people. Everything was separate. And so in his lifetime, he experienced a lot of racism, a lot of mistreatment. And his way of dealing with that, instead of just kind of, you know, saying that he was a victim, he more imagined himself as an alien, just somebody who was from another planet rather than just being a different race. He's just from another planet. And so that was why people didn't understand him. It's not because he was black, it was because he was from Saturn and people just weren't used to people from Saturn. And so he took it as, I just have to show them what it's like to be from Saturn. So his music and everything was about expressing his humanity or you know his alienness as a as a way to reflect, you know, the fact that we're all the same actually. Um and so his music was always looking out, was always looking at being cosmic as a way of kind of creating a metaphor for the conditions of uh black Americans. So <clears throat> as as we evolve, we get into the seventies, um, with groups like Parliament Funkadelic, who I'm sure some of you may have heard of. And then we also get through to the 80s. Um, now, one of the biggest things that I actually want to focus on this evening is an innovation that happened around the mid 70s, early 80s, which was sampling. So if we're not familiar with sampling, sampling is essentially when you take a piece of audio and you use it to create new music. So this is essentially a technique that had started as early as the 1940s, but became extremely popular in hip hop music. So the idea of just taking a record and either taking one part of that record and looping it over and over, or taking a, a tiny section and combining it with other tiny sections of other songs and creating something completely new. This was an innovative new way to make music. And it completely fell within the theme of Afrofuturism because a lot of this started in the mid 70s in 80s where in America, especially in New York, which is where hip hop started, um, the school systems after, after desegregation, um, a lot of school systems in certain areas were left with very few resources. So instead of having music programs where students could learn instruments, they didn't have that. So, you know, what people would do is they would use their, their records, their turntables, and they would just go set up and play in the park and play parties and they learn how to use the actual turntable or the, the DJ mixer, which you might see in the two records. They learn how to make this into their own instrument by taking records and looping different sections and combining them. And so nowadays we actually have instruments called samplers that take audio and allow you to manipulate it. But during, these, during this time, it was actually a new technology and people were figuring it out. And part of that was out of resistance. It was out of, okay, we don't have instruments we're going to create our own music. So part of, part of what I want to show you is how to sample, how do we make music from other music. So I actually, I pulled up a couple examples here and I'm going to this time share my whole screen so you can see. Let's see. And share the sound. Okay. So now you should be able to see my screen here. And what you're seeing is actually this is a music production software program so this is how people essentially make music on the computer so what i have here this is something i found on the internet let's see if it'll play Okay, let's see, this should play now. This I found online, I believe is some type of temple theme song. So, 
not my favorite piece of music, but I can give you an example of how somebody might take that and sample it and create something new. So let's see. So basically, over time, as I was explaining with hip hop, eventually you got machines called samplers that allowed you to manipulate audio in different ways. So there are three primary ways that people do this. They do what's called flipping or looping. So they just find a good loop and then they and, and a piece of music and then they just repeat it over and over. Or they chop it, which is they take little tiny sections and rearrange them and create new music. Or they reverse it. So they just turn everything backwards and just see it, you know, see hear what it sounds like. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try reversing it. Just to see what that sounds like. This, well first let's play the whole thing so we know what it sounds like. Okay, so I don't think I need much more than just this first part. Get rid of that. And so the first thing I can do is reverse it. Let's see what it sounds like backwards. Hmm. Not really feeling it backwards. But I think there's something good in here. Let's see. So, like I said, another technique is what's called chopping. So what we can do is, you see, I'm placing these little markers on different parts of the audio, and it's going to cut it up. And that way, I can kind of replay everything how I want it. Alright, so now I'm going to... Let's see. I'm going to basically make a new instrument with um, all these little mark markers that I put down, which are basically the, the song cut up. So let's see. Right, so now I can really play around with this audio. And what's nice is that I can actually go in and any clip that I like, I can mess around with and edit. That's good. All right, so let's see. Now, we, yeah, we discussed flipping, chopping, and looping. So what I'm going to actually, oh, we also, uh, another technique people use is pitching. And I think that's going to be the one that I like the most for this, is pitching. So. Yeah, I like that. I think I just want that section. So now, when actually creating songs like this in this kind of digital format, there's actually a couple of little rules. Um, you know, one of the main things is finding the tempo, which is basically how fast or slow a song is. Right now, it says that it should be 83. I don't necessarily know if that's right or not, but you can see what 83 sounds like.
I want to start it right where it says T. So I'm just going right here. That's it. Nice. And then I'm going to repeat that a couple times. But I think I'm going to let it have some song space. And you can actually hear um, the bump, 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 bump. That's kind of giving it a tempo, right? This first part. So I can really take that and make it its own thing. Now, we talked about pitching it. I'm gonna pitch this down. Maybe not that much. Yeah, I like that. So, what's happening now is that everything that this song was is becoming a lot more abstract. And I'm just taking different sections of it and creating new music with it. Right, so I just took that first little part and I'm creating some, you know, basically my own little melody. Turn this up like that. So, let's see what this sounds like. Okay, now we have something going. And I'm going to loop that. I'm going to add some drums. So now we have a basic little Temple University remix from that sample. Let's see what it sounds like all together. So that was a quick, 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 quick example of how sampling works. And I think sampling is really one of the most important innovations, at least the way in which it's used now, that's happened in the 20th, 20th and 21st century as far as uh, music is concerned, especially as, um, as far as black music is concerned, and this kind of uh, lineage starting from you know, 
starting from uh, gospel and blues and jazz and funk and all that to where we are today with modern hip hop and R and B and all these things. The idea of taking other music and taking other sounds and creating something new is extremely um, is extremely innovative, but also it reflects these ideas of Afrofuturism or essentially creating a new imagined world. So one of the great things I like about sampling is that you could take something that you're familiar with or something that you have some type of nostalgia with and you can reimagine it. So um, in the beginning of this talk, before everybody walked in or digitally disappeared, I was playing a song by Janelle Monet called Say You Will. And actually, I'll share my screen because I have it here. Let's put you guys back here. Um, so yeah, I say it's called Say You Will, sorry. And this is the end of it. Now, what's great about this song is that this is an original song, but what she actually does, she doesn't sample um, another song, but what she does is incorporate a, uh, an, an old classical song by Claude Debussy called Claire de Lune. And she's reinterpreted in her own way, and she kind of remixes it and makes it her own thing. So you can see here it goes kind of to the classical piece. Right. So when I first heard this song, uh, I thought it was amazing, mostly because I recognized the sample, even though it wasn't a sample. And this is one of the, the things that people oftentimes are able to do with music is that they can find influences and in whether it could be classical music or music from various, you know, points in the African diaspora and they can bring it into their music. So a lot of times in modern music, people do that by actually taking the audio and just sampling it and flipping it. But sometimes you can also replay it or do what's called interpolation, which is where you can have musicians come in and actually interpret an older piece of music. So with, with this, we can do the same thing, is we can take this and we can sample it and create a new piece of music. So this is the technique I explained of chopping, where I'm just taking little bits of it. And then I'm going to take another little piece. Let me do this with the mention now. Take this little section right here. And now I'm going to change the pitch and make it completely different.
And then I'm just gonna add, maybe I'm just gonna add a little instrument. Let's see what it sounds like. Right? So, essentially, all I'm doing is just taking any little sound, anything that I hear, and trying to create new music with it. And this is the techniques that you're going to hear in a lot of popular songs now. But a lot of this uh, innovation really does come from kind of underground places of music. So the the links to all of this, these things I, that I've discussed today is really this Afrofuturism movement. So I do want to play a couple, uh, a couple more examples uh, for you so you understand kind of the link. So when we talked about Sun Ra, and I, I've also mentioned Janelle Monet. I also want to mention someone who I think is extremely important to this whole movement uh, in the modern sense. And this is a producer named Flying Lotus. And Flying Lotus essentially, ah, I don't even know how to describe him. But some of you may, have, may be familiar with him, may not. I'm trying to think what's the best thing I can play that. And maybe I can just play a snippet of this. I think you're still hearing my audio. Let's see. Now, I'll put the links in the chat to the music. that all day and I recommend that everybody check out these links further that I just posted in the chat and also thank you for everyone who's been active in the chat um, I'm gonna stop talking for a second and see uh, 
if anybody had any questions, you can feel free to unmute and ask, or you can even write in the chat, because I know I moved through a lot of different things really fast. Um, but yeah, if there's anything that anybody wants to ask real quick, please uh, feel free to, to let me know. If not, I will continue on. So, okay. So basically, um, the main thing that I wanted to kind of tie in all together with the things that I've been uh, expressing here is this idea of creative imagination, right? And recently, this last semester, I taught a workshop at Carnegie Hall about this topic, about creative imagination. And the idea was that basically we told our teachers, essentially the, the class was for teachers who work in middle school and high schools, and we gave them an exercise to imagine themselves a hundred years in the future and what that world would look like, what it would smell like, taste like, what things they would be doing, what they would see. And the idea was this was the point that we wanted them to start from when we approached writing songs with their classes so to you know take the idea of songwriting and creating music and take it completely out of your current reality and you know the things that make sense to you right now and to completely put it in this future reality in this future world where anything and everything is possible right and then to work your way back from that so this idea of creative imagination is definitely the thread that connects all these artists that I've put here in the chat and you know myself as well um, definitely music in the black experience in the black diaspora and african-american tradition has always been a form of escapism has always been a form of storytelling um, and has always been a form of resistance and I would say that you know the intersection of music and technology specifically has allowed for so many different forms of creative expression and creative imagination. In today's world, we're fortunate that we can essentially make music on our laptops, we can make music on our phone, we can make music anywhere. And so we're not so much limited by resources, it's more about our imaginations and how we can imagine. And I think that's one of the things that I wanted to bring to the Black History uh, event um, is really the idea of reframing and recontextualizing Black History Month or these ideas into more of, you know, Black future, right? These are the thing that's just kind of been coming up recently, this month especially. Um, for those of you who may follow Kanye West, you know, him declaring this Black Future Month. But this is also something, a sentiment that's been going on for a couple of years amongst a lot of black artists is that, you know, we don't necessarily want to, we don't want to dismiss or forget our history. In fact, it's an essential point. It is a very central point of understanding our present moment and understanding what our future can be. But we also, as artists, want to focus on and inspire others and ourselves to look at what the future can hold and, and what is the future of black music, what is the future of black musical expression and how does that relate to the rest of the world. As I've seen it, uh, since I've been in Italy for maybe five, almost six years, I've seen so much of Italian hip hop evolve and a lot of it evolved based on uh, the sounds that have, you know, coming from America and also coming from the regions that I grew up in. Um, I'm from the South, and so I hear a lot of kind of Italian trap music uh, developing over the last few years, and that was such an interesting thing for me to witness as an outsider coming in, but to see this kind of evolution from, you know, two different points of the world, but to see how things have been influenced by each other. Um, and so for me, I think uh, we're continuously pressing forward and trying to redefine our future. And all these artists are always trying to do that. They're trying to redefine their current reality and trying to give people a lens into what their reality 
could be, right? Like, what what could you imagine? How could you imagine a better uh, future for yourself? So that's really the the main thing that I wanted to discuss, and um, I I do want to open because I know we're we're getting low on time. I do want to make sure uh, if there are any questions or any things that people want to know about the things that I've shown here that I don't uh, you know that don't, that leaves some time for that. Charles, thank you so much mm -hmm. for for this workshop, which has been amazing to just see like what so much you can do. Even <laughs> with like with so simple, like I do a bit of editing because I do audio editing, like voice. But I was just thinking, well, there is so much you can do, so much potential that sometimes you don't see, maybe because you're not an expert, but just seeing what you did, even just with the temple chants and so on, it's been like really incredible. I actually have a question as people are shy about all people warming up to start asking questions. So a, a question came, came to me, probably more like philosophical than more related to music, which is you were talking about the importance of imagination, right? For black artists, and especially you spoke about an artist that said, Oh, I'm from Mars, I'm an alien. So, my question for you is so, how does, how can imagination bring alien, but how don't we fall into denial? Because, for example, you mentioned Kanye West, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I remember a few years ago, I made a comment about like slavery being a choice. Mm -hmm. So, thinking of co comments like this, or someone that's looking at the future, so. How do we keep the balance, for example? How does imagination bring healing? And how how don't we fall in denial? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I think, you know, sp speaking about denial, you know, I think denial, a lot of times people don't realize that denial is a form of grief. And a lot of especially black people in America are dealing with grief and trauma of just the experience of their ancestors and the experience of how they are, you know, treated within America. So sometimes the denial of wanting to accept how harsh conditions may actually be leads us to kind of imagine like, oh, you know, these problems don't even exist and whatever, whatever. And that can be dangerous too, because it's really just kind of a way to mask pain. And so to me, I think the importance of the imagination part is the healing and that healing starts with acknowledging what the pain is and acknowledging okay what what is the problem or why am i hurting or what are these things that are bothering me so that i can imagine something better than this condition so that i can heal past it rather than deny you know what's going on um and i think that's why creating art is so important because I think art allows you to take the issues of society or your own personal thing and kind of make them abstract enough so that they can almost become, you, you abstract them from yourself so that they can become general, general enough for everybody to understand them in a sense or everyone to connect in some way, right? And so I, I do think imagination is an important tool with healing, but the most important thing is acknowledging the truth whatever that truth is, right? And I don't think there's any way or any path to true healing, whether in a community sense or in a personal sense, without acknowledging, you know, the truth of whatever that pain is, right? And if we use our imaginations to just deny it, then it kind of creates the same cycle over and over. So uh, for me as an artist and for the artists that I look up to and respect, um, creative imagination is always at the root of it, the center of it, acknowledging and addressing whatever the pain is first so that we can heal and say, okay, we're going to take this thing and we're going to make something better out of it. We're going to take this pain and we're going to make something stronger and better out of it. Thank you so much for your answer as well. Okay. It, it was make me think. I think I'll, I will be thinking in the next few days a lot. <laughs> <laughs> as if I don't do it enough. So anyone from the public, any questions that you may ask, please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat as well. Okay, I see your question from Genevieve was asking. I'm curious about how Italian hip hop and trap music sounds. Are there artists you would suggest to listen to? Hmm. I mean, 
And to be honest with the artists I would suggest to listen to, no, not, not necessarily. But um, I've heard, you know, I think honestly, like if you, what's the guy? Um, hold on, I can I can look real quick and I can show you what's out there. Um, I mean, there are a lot, there's actually a lot of good Italian hip hop um, that I've been that I've kind of come across. Not a lot of the new stuff. I'm not so into, uh, but let's see. let's see if I can find find the stuff because I, I really don't um yeah I really don't listen to this guy so there's this guy uh, here let's see yeah I'm. I'm not condoning whatever I'm putting here. I'm just saying I know who the guy is. So don't you know? Don't take this as <laughs> that this is my personal recommendations. But I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna put these links here so you can see what's happening. You know, and you can decide for yourself whether you like it or not. It's not not necessarily for me. But it's the point I made about it is that you can tell it's very much influenced by what's going on in America. Oh, I see another question. Are there any genre artists that you've been sampling from recently that, that have inspired your creative imagination? Actually, yes. Uh, I've recently gotten into Italian film music. Um, and there's this guy, what's his name? Uh, his name is, is Piero, Piero Piccioni. That's his, that's his name. And he's done like a lot of a lot of film scores, like tons and tons and tons of film scores um, for like a lot of the Italian music uh, movies from the forties, fifties, and sixties. And I just did like a, a concert honoring his hundredth year. He's he's not alive, but he would have been a hundred this last year. So he's really really great. I love sampling his music. I just dropped the link. To, to his music as well. Um, yeah, I find a lot of inspiration in film music, actually. Um, John Williams is one of my favorite composers. There's a new guy named Ludwig uh, Garrison who's really, really great. Um, he did the music to Black Panther and a lot of um, more recent stuff on Disney+. Plus. So it's a lot of... I really like film music, honestly. Um, but yeah, I listen to everything as far as sampling. Everything... Um, I guess also I should mention, like, that's also what I do. I create samples. I, I have what's called a sample pack label. And so me and, t and my team of musicians, we create music for other musicians to sample and um, make music with. And so we distribute our music, uh, our samples on a, a platform called Splice, which is the biggest online platform for, uh, like, digital music distribution of samples, not not for selling records, but for selling samples. Um, and so, yeah, that's actually my main thing now. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, all the drum stuff that you heard me use um, this evening is actually from sample packs that I've made. Or, in fact, the ones that you heard me use is from an Italian drummer who's about to release a sample pack on my label. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, what, it, what we do. Oh, let's see, I see another question. Can you talk about some differences between the music scene in Italy versus the U.S.? Um, what I can say about the music scene in Italy is that there are a lot of great musicians. Um, and I can't speak for all of Italy because I haven't, you know, been through all, all of Italy. I can, you know, say, say what I observe about the scene here in Rome and maybe in Milan. Seems like the pop music scene and the the mainstream hip hop scene is in Milan. Um, it seems like everything else is down here in Rome. Um, I would say that there's not uh, a lot of uh, there's not a lot of support for for local artists here. It kind of seems like okay, the musicians playing at clubs, okay, whatever, but. It, it seems like a hard place if you're trying to get your name out there doing your own original music. It seems kind of like a hard place to, to do that because there are not a lot of clubs 
that showcase that kind of thing. It seems like here mostly it's everything is very specific. So you have jazz clubs, then you have restaurants, and then you have like DJ places, but not a lot of places where you can go and hear original music. Um, but uh, in the U.S., what I love is that there are a lot of uh, what we call do-it-yourself music scenes, DIY music scenes, and you kind of find a place for every new type of music and every you know new band coming up, which is I really love because that way people are able to develop their sound and you know have audiences to experiment with their music and get feedback and figure things out. So. I used to live in New York, and that was one of my favorite things about living in New York, is that you could go out to different places and hear different types of music everywhere. So, I love that. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, uh, often samples come from non-musical sources. Are there any examples of sounds you transform? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sam samples, samples can be anything. Um, it doesn't have to be music. In fact, uh, I love actually sampling texture. Um, I don't think, maybe I do have it, uh, I think I can briefly show you, um, let's see. So we're back here in my screen, and so over here I have my sample packs, and this one here, uh, in the drum loops, percussion loops, that loop right there is is just my cheeks that I manipulated slightly. Uh, that was. Not this exact toy, but a toy like this, and I just kind of rubbed it, and then I it made it made that sound. Uh, same. This was George's toy. Another children's toy. Those are chopsticks. Okay. Well, a lot of those textures came from basically things I had in my house because I was making this sample pack in the beginning of the pandemic. So I couldn't really go a lot of places. So I just would find things and figure it out. Uh, I'm trying to see. Some of these might also be just random sounds. Uh, yeah, there's there's so much that you can do uh, with non-musical samples, which I think is actually even the, the best thing because you're not tied into a note or a key or anything like that. So I do love um, making music out of any sound. To me, that's the most exciting thing, is turning something that's not meant to make music into a musical instrument. Uh, now, I know we're running out of time, so uh, last thing, what made me move to Italy? Family. Uh, my family is here, my, my beautiful partner is here, our kids are here, and so I moved here about five, no, six years ago, before the birth of my son, and I've been here ever since. Um, Mostly uh, working as a music producer, sometimes as a live musician, traveling and performing. Uh, I taught some class at St. Louis College of Music, John Cabot University, um, and currently uh, doing work for Carnegie Hall. And like I said, I design samples and make sample packs. And yeah, that's kind of the, the synopsis of what I do. And I think sampling, like I said, is this really cool kind of marriage of technology and, and music. And that's why I want to talk about it today as far as the extension of Afrofuturism, the extension of black music and, you know, my topic really being about imagining a better future and black future and using these tools for creative imagination of our future. So 
I hope everyone has enjoyed themselves and found something interesting in what I had to say. And thank you so much, Simple, for having me. And this has been a really, really great experience for me. Thank you so much, Charles, for being with us. And thank you for the precious insight that you have shared. I think this is a key event to conclude a Black History Month. Of course, we have another exhibition, which is called Black Future, that is open till the 2nd of March, which you can come and see in person in our gallery. But thank you so much for this event and for this special insight. Uh, definitely, you can be in touch with Charles. We will share with you the link to the event as well and the Charles's content so you can be in touch with him. And thank you so much to each one of you that participated. And I want to thank everybody that's been here. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you, Benedetta. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>